Dr. Samit Teoshia as an assistant professor in the Department of Plastic Surgery. Um, he has a very active practice in breast reconstruction and other microvascular surgery, but I would argue, and I imagine he would argue, even more importantly, um, he's both an accomplished artist and a world-renowned humanitarian. He's a classically painted trainer, um, an artist, and um, a charter member of Alliance for Smiles, and now a surgeon for Operation Smile. Um, in that capacity, he's performed over 300 cleft palate and repairs on children all around the world, um, and we are honored to have him here to share with us his passion for art, um, for humanitarianism, and for plastic surgery. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Smit Teoshia. Well, I have to be honest, I'm extremely anxious because I realize that all my distinguished colleagues are full tenured professors, and uh, maybe I can get a recommendation letter for a promotion at the end of the talk. But, uh, anyway, um, you know, I was, uh, I was a son of a military uh, major general, and so I was scarred very, at a very early age because my dad moved me about 45 times around the world. So all I could do was doodle since uh, I've been still trying to search friends and family, and uh, doodling at an early age, and this was when I was six, I used to copy. And I copied Tolstoy's works, I copied figures and illustrations, and, and I realized that from an early age to even up to medical school, I had attained a level that I was comfortable with, however, I was just not getting better. And so, during my years in medical school, I started to doodle better. I went to the anatomy lab, and all you guys will take anatomy lab, I would copy Frank Nutter, who is a, an anatomical artist. But uh, later do I realize now that I'm actually operating on these areas, everything is wrong, okay? <laughs> so if I actually perform surgery based on my own drawings previously as a medical student, I think UT Southwestern will have to increase their cap on my malpractice. <laughs> but in uh, any case, I, uh, I learned to observe, I learned to draw. And uh, one, of my, one of the vascular surgeons in Virginia, uh, when I was a medical student, said, can you draw me the carotid endarterectomy? And I said, absolutely, but can I do it beautifully? And so this is a plaque taken out from the carotid artery. And uh, still today, I, I don't think this instrument exists. And uh, I've made it up. And so obviously, a wrong procedure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, my drawings also extended to my failed social venues, okay? <laughs> so when I would go out, you know, with other medical students on perhaps dates, uh, usually the inspiration came from the lady, and, and usually the line would be, I think you're too quirky, I think you're awkward, I think we don't see eye to eye, we're split. And so I said, you know what, that inspired me. So I made the date experience into a split sagittal plane. That's how I saw things. Obviously, uh, she's, a, she's an infectious disease doctor somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as I mentioned, during medical school years, I just wanted to get better. I wanted to get better for my sense of observation. And you, you, we all see things, but we don't necessarily all observe. And I want to uh, impress upon you that you will develop these uh, techniques and this sense of observation during your years in medical school. So I started traveling. I went to New York, uh, Sweden. Florence, Italy, Paris, France, went over some of the drawings of uh, Rubens and uh, da Vinci that were accessible at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, France, and I went with my mentors and teachers. I found my teachers everywhere, and you will find your teachers hidden in the corners of the world. They will teach you, and they may not have any titles, but they will teach you more than other, others that you may have even learned. So all these years that I spent during medical school, during my surgical years, during my training, I said, I gotta get better. And how do you get better? in seeing things. Because if you can see, you can observe. And if you can observe, you can treat. And if you can treat, you can diagnose appropriately as well. And you will tend to do that. So you take a drawing, something like this, and you deconstruct it into lines. And remember, in nature, lines don't exist. We use them as references. And so this is a reference. And I would tell you that I would spend days on this skeleton, because this is where it starts, from inside out. And then you can take a contour profiles and break it into small parts and pieces. And even then, multiple mistakes, because we will make mistakes throughout our lives, throughout our careers. I make mistakes in every operation I do, and I learn from it. And I'm hoping by the time of the end of my career that maybe those mistakes get less and less and that my patients benefit from it. So how do you progress from that? You deconstruct into parts, and then those parts then become a whole. 
and you start to squint your eyes, you start to see things. And as you start seeing things, you start thinking, well, it's going to emerge. And it's an exciting feeling because this is, as I mentioned, it's a practice. And it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of this, which you'll be dedicating your life towards medicine. And these are obviously during the time in my residency years and 10 years during general surgery, cardiac surgery, and plastic surgery that uh, I started to get better. And, uh, and, I, and you guys are way ahead of the game, about two decades. Um, and then you start to steal away the lines, because I mentioned the lines don't exist from nature. Uh, line starts to disappear, and it starts to become softer, starts to become a form. And how do you make that into a final drawing? Well, you start adding things, and you start subtracting things and you start molding, and all of a sudden, something as simple as that almost becomes academic and beautiful without its form, without pretension, without saying that this is someone and such and so. And you can carry that, and uh, I did this exercise a few years ago for the medical students and my residents who I teach, that, um, and believe me, it, it took me six months to make six of these, and they're nearly identical, uh, to show that the process and what's involved in it. Uh, you can carry that into charcoal, and uh, as uh, Leonardo would say, um, uh, if, you can, if you can draw, that's all you need to do as a scientist and as a physician, and he was all of that. So uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit more uh, time on this slide because this is probably the crux of it. Uh, as you sense to observe the world, you know that it's natural. And if you believe that light, either it's particle or a wave, it doesn't really matter, it behaves the same way. So we have a single source of light in this world. Uh, it's the sun, and everything else depends on it. How we see things, how we observe, how we diagnose, it's how our perception in the retina is. And so light does pretty much five things. This is the existence of human uh, nature. So the whitest white is called the, the reflected light. That is the light that comes in the naked paper, come directly at your eyes, it's bouncing straight. And so that's why it's white. And when you interrupt that light, it's called a shadow. In this case, the darkest dark. So you look at the highlight and you look at the darkest dark and that's called a cast shadow. So that's two things. The third thing that happens is that that form, and I know this is abstract concepts, that form has a shadow by itself, but it's just a little lighter. And it is, believe me, look at the paintings, look at drawings. And that's called a form shadow. So from the highlight to cast shadow to form shadow, and obviously light diffuses. It comes from everywhere, it's multiple sources, because there cannot be a black hole here with all light that absorbs. So that light and that beautiful whiteness and that sheen and that glow, what we call atmosphere, is made up of reflected light, lights that bouncing back into the medium. And this is how you see it. And I, it didn't I didn't realize it, that this is what happens. And it's very simple. And I have to tell you, this is not art. I cannot teach art, just like I cannot teach surgery. I can teach surgical procedure, but surgery, medicine, takes a lifetime. And that is up to you, that you will develop your skills here. So as I travel around the world, and I ran into probably Dr. Palmer, I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> I was carrying with my surgical instruments, and he was with his ropes and hooks uh, over here. But some of the mission trips that I've done, I carry these concepts uh, uh, throughout the world as I start operating. And so if you see that, of course, you have to make lines. But those lines go away. Lines get replaced by incisions. Incisions turns into edges, and edges into contour. And contour makes form, and shadow, and light, and atmosphere in every little different baby. And so the next day, you can see that the full pout of the lip come across. The shadows become a little bit better. And you end up with hopefully a happy mother and a drooling kid, and uh, and you know in in Luxor, Egypt, um, some of the defects that you see are extremely big. But the same concepts, everything is depends. And so, you know, you get an email from a, a crying mother over the uh, a few years later, said thank you for helping my baby, and he is now very happy. And I'll tell you, of course, the scar is uh, is, is not aesthetic, but it's just a scar. It's the contour that matters. And I want you to impress that it doesn't matter. The shape and shadows make more difference than the scar itself. 
And so in Tunisia, this lovely young girl who grew up to have a horrible defect, but the mom said, now, she's, now every boy lo loves her. So, um, and, and I've operated, fortunately, as, as small as two and a half months old, it's about as small as uh, I can do in, in remote corners of the world to about as older as some disfigured uh, young man with clefts on each side, the hole in the middle of the face, and teeth and awkward. And you know, he said, now I can actually go out on a date and I can go outside my village and I can have a job and go from the rice fields to have a position in this world. And that is a very humbling experience. And when the mother brings you a 12 year old and say, you know, and you look at it, you observe it, you can see it, but you need to sense it. And so these shadows and the pouting and the hole in the teeth, the hole in the palate, and the drooling kid and the shy girl just becomes so unconfident and you see her about a week later and you know, I happen to do things that I wouldn't do here. Uh, you know, a rhinoplasty, a cleft lip, a cleft palate, a bone graft, a teeth work, you know, five, six hours later, you can uh, make into a girl that I even couldn't recognize and an anesthesiologist was totally crying at that time. These are teaching trips. Uh, these are trips that I am humbled to say that Chinese medical students, uh, medical students from Philippines, from Southeast Asia, from Africa, they come learn from me, and I'm extremely humble. I'll tell you, this slide is particularly impo important because he was the chief of stomatology in China. And he came over and asked me some questions and started drawing what I did in the marks. I said, you know, uh, I usually uh, you know, draw uh, every day uh, after some of these procedures, and I can show you how I did. And he copied all my drawings. And uh, then he asked me uh, how many I've done. I said, well, you know, I was uh, feeling very confident as a young surgeon. I said, you know, I've done only a few hundred, uh, but I'm getting better. And I asked him, how about yourself, sir? He said, I've done 5,000. And the chill came from my body because here's this unknown person who cares not. And you learn from that. So I went back to his library and saw his drawings and saw his marks, saw his experience from 30 years ago, and he, here he is trying to learn from an American surgeon. And, and uh, stories of 90-year-old surgeon across that you run into will come that they will be your teachers. Your teachers are here, this is where you will start, but you will have teachers the rest of your life un until the end in medicine or surgery. So to wrap it up, um, I'll quote a, a famous man who said, students that aim at rapid progress in science, medicine, teach us to imitate and represent nature's work, which is to see the world, which is to see your patients, should devote themselves chiefly to drawing. And if you have successfully do that, then you will be a great physician. Um, and one of uh, Apelles, who was uh, the court painter for Alexander the Great, says, never go a day without you do not pick up a pen or a pencil and draw or write. I know we have this great technology, texting, computers, Write a letter. When was the last time you wrote a nice two-page letter? Do that. Do that on occasions, whether it's small note or the sentence. And I'm very uh, happy to announce that UT Southwestern uh, will be, as an elective, will be offering an elective in medical school uh, as uh, a classical figure drawing course, and I'll be the preceptor for that. So I hope to see you there. It's the only such course uh, in any medical school in the country, and. Uh, Hope to see all of you there, and we'll do some simple drawings. Uh, thank you for your time.